first thing that we're going to do is go through Revelation chapter 13 and verses 11 through 18, and you will notice that I have inserted in brackets certain explanations uh, in this passage. So I'm going to go through the passage, add those explanations, make a few, uh, a few remarks, and then uh, we are going to uh, study in more detail all of those uh, aspects as we go along today. So Revelation 13 verse 11 reads, Then, that means when the first beast receives its deadly wound, I saw another beast coming up. The expression coming up is used, for example, in Matthew 13 verse 7. It's the word anabino in Greek. And it refers to a plant that is just sprouting out of the earth, which means that this nation is going to be a nation that is just having its origin at that time, around the time of the deadly wound. And it says that it came out of the earth. This is a different place than the first beasts. The first four beasts comes, come out of the waters, out of the sea. But this beast must rise in a different place because it comes out of the earth. And then we are told that he had two horns like a lamb. Now, in the book of Revelation, the word lamb is used a total of 29 times. And uh, I believe in every reference, the word lamb refers to Jesus Christ. At least in 28 of the references, indisputably, it refers to Christ. And here, I believe that it is related to Christ. It has to be because the word lamb in Revelation refers to Jesus. But you'll notice here that it says that he had two horns like a lamb. In other words, there's some Christ-like feature about this beast. But he spoke like a dragon. And uh, as we've studied and we'll also study today, the dragon is a symbol of Satan working through what? Working through Rome. So somehow this beast is connected with Rome because the dragon attempted to kill the male, male child. That's Satan working through Rome. Then that dragon beast gave its throne, its seat and authority to the uh, beast, the sea beast, and it rules by the authority of Rome. So if, if this beast speaks like a dragon, it must be speaking not only like Satan, it must be speaking like what? It must be speaking like Rome. So this beast is related to Rome in some way. Verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Now, uh, in his presence, according to um, those experts in the meaning of words in the New Testament, means at the first beast's commissioning or on behalf of the first beast. So this, this beast is somehow related not only to Rome, it's related to the first beast of Revelation 13, the beast that we studied about in our last several classes. So it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes. Causes is a word that in this context means that it uses what? It uses compulsion. It obligates. It does not persuade. It, com it, it practices compulsion. So it says, and causes the earth, we're going to notice especially here, the earth refers to uh, the United States. But we're going to notice that the whole world is involved as well. So it says, the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. In other words, this beast uh, commands everyone by compulsion to worship the sea beast that we studied about in our last classes. Then verse 13, he, that is the land beast, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Uh, this is reminiscent of the story of Elijah who made fire come down from heaven and also Pentecost where you see the tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. So somehow this beast is going to bring a counterfeit Revival of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight 
of, there's an, once again the same expression, in the sight of or at the commissioning of the beast. Telling those, and the NIV translates this, he ordered them, so this is an order, this is not a command, this is, not, uh, this is a command, it's not simply a suggestion. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. Now, uh, the preposition that is used here, to the beast, is in the dative case in Greek. That probably doesn't mean much to you. But basically, when it's in the dative case, it means in honor of the first beast. So in other words, it makes an image in honor of the first beast. Uh, now, let's continue our reading here. So once again, we go to verse 14. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of or at the commissioning of the beast, telling those, that is, ordering them who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that is in honor of the beast, who was wounded by the sword and lived. Clearly this is the beast that came from the sea, right? Verse 15, he, that is the first beast, this is the first beast in the light of Ellen White's comment in Spalding McGann, pages 1 and 2, which is at the very end of this material that, that we're going to be studying. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Now here, of is in the genitive case, which, which, means, uh, which means that he makes an image of the beast, a replica of the beast. Not, he's not making an image in honor of the beast, but he's making an image as a replica of the beast. So he's doing both things. He's making an image to honor the beast and which is a replica of the beast. Are you following me or not? Uh, so it says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of, once again, replica, of the beast should both speak and cause. Speak, how does, a, how does a nation speak? How does a beast speak? Through its legislative and its judicial authority, right? Especially when you're dealing with a nation that is a republic. Uh, you know, it speaks through Congress, if you please. And then it says, and cause, once again, compulsion, cause as many as would not worship the image of, once again, the, a replica, the idea of a replica, the image of the beast, to be killed. He causes, the NIV translates, he forced everyone, which is really the sense of, of the verb. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark. And we are going to study this later on, what the mark of the beast is, a little bit later on in this class. And uh, it imposes the mark of the beast on the right hand, and, and where? Or on their foreheads. Now, the mark of the beast is given in two places. The seal of God is given in only one. Why? There's a specific reason why. And uh, on the right hand would mean out of convenience so that they can buy or sell, even though they know that what the beast is requiring is wrong. But out of being able to buy and sell and not being killed, <laughs> they'll go along. And on the forehead means that they are convicted that the beast is right. We're going to notice that. Verse 17, And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, and I believe the name of the beast is vicarious fili dei. That means uh, one who takes the place of the Son of God, one who, one who is the vicar of Jesus Christ. So it says, Who has the mark of, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The number is 666. And then it says in verse 18, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So you have to do some uh, mathematical figuring, don't you? In order, to, in order to determine what the number of the beast is. For it is the number of a man. Actually, um, a better translation, it is the number of man, not a man, it, uh, there is not an indefinite article there, uh, it simply is the number of man, and his number is 666. So those are all of the exegetical remarks 
that I, I wanted to share with you at the very beginning so that when we go through in detail, uh, we'll, have, we'll be on the same page. We'll, be, we'll have a complete picture. So let's go now to the chronology of Revelation 12 and 13. This will be just a review. Uh, you remember that in Revelation chapter 12, towards the end of the chapter, we have three consecutive stages. First of all, in verses 13 through 15, we have the period of dominion of the papacy, uh, the 1260 years. You remember that? Then we have the next uh, stage, which is the earth what? Helping the woman. That's in verse 16. And then finally, there's a third stage, which is the dragon enraged with the woman and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you have the 1260 years, the earth helps the woman, and then the dragon is filled with rage because the earth helped the woman. Now, Revelation 13 has the same basic sequence. In Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, we have this sea beast that rules 42 months, the same time period. Then, in the second uh, place, we have a beast that rises where? From the earth. Is that the, in the same place in the sequence? Now a nation is rising in that territory that was spoken of in Revelation chapter 12. So it says a second beast rises from the earth, and then we are told that it what? It speaks like a dragon. Is that the same sequence of Revelation 12? Yes. So basically, Revelation 13 is an amplification of Revelation chapter 12. Raise your hand if you understood what I'm saying here. Praise the Lord. You're great students. <laughs> now, let's make some exegetical remarks. We've already mentioned some of these, but uh, let's specify a little bit more. The word earth in Revelation 13, 11 to 18 has a restricted meaning in this chapter. In context, it applies primarily to the geographical territory of the United States. You say, why would that be? Well, because the beast rises from the earth. And the earth, we're going to notice, is the territory of the United States. So when the word earth is used, it refers to what? It refers primarily to the United States, although we know the whole world is going to wander after the beast. But the emphasis here is something that is happening where? In the United States of America. The expression coming up is used in Matthew chapter 13, verse 7, to describe weeds that sprout up from the earth, which means that this beast, uh, uh, in Revelation 13, verse 11, when John sees this beast, it is just sprouting up. It is beginning its existence. As we shall see later in our study, the dragon is a symbol of Satan working through the instrumentality of Rome. The dragon in the book of Revelation is always identified with different stages of Rome. Rome tried to kill Jesus. Papal Rome persecuted the saints of the Most High during the 1260 years. So if the beast at the end speaks like a dragon, it must be acting like Rome did when it tried to kill Jesus and like Rome did during the 1260 years. Are you following me? Now the word lamb is used 29 times in the book of Revelation. In 28 of those 29 times, it refers, it refers indisputably to Jesus Christ. And we will also see that it is closely related with Jesus Christ also in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Another important point is that the expression, and spoke like a dragon, can legitimately be translated in two different ways. It can be translated, uh, and it spoke like a dragon, or it could be translated, but he spoke like a dragon. Now, both of these translations complement one another. The first translation would indicate that the land beast has two horns like a lamb, while at the same time it speaks like a dragon. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So it has the two horns, but at the same time it speaks like a dragon. The second translation would be a contrast. Even though it has two horns like a lamb, it speaks like a dragon. In other words, a contrast rather than emphasizing that it's doing this while it has the two horns like a lamb. 
Now it bears noting that the land beast does everything to honor and impress the first beast. Did you notice that in this passage? It's like this, the destiny of this second beast is to help the first beast in every way. Notice all of the evidence from this passage. First of all, we are told that the land beast exercises all of the authority of whom? Of the first beast. We're also told that the land beast, uh, the, I shouldn't say lamb beast, but the beast with lamb-like horns, actually commands everyone to what? To worship the first beast. Everything it does, it does at the commissioning of the first beast or on behalf of the first beast. The expression is used in the sight of the beast. This beast from the earth uh, imposes the mark of the beast. It also makes an image of the beast. And it gives a death decree against those who do not worship the image of the beast. Somehow I get the impression that this second beast wants to honor the first one. <laughs> In other words, this second beast is closely linked with the first beast. Now, if the first beast is papal Rome, does the second beast have any relationship with papal Rome? Of course. That's why it speaks like what? Like a dragon. That's right. Now, according to the best lexicons, those are dictionaries, the expression in the sight of the beast means at the commissioning of the first beast. Thus, this second beast is the first beast's agent or puppet. The word cause, this is an important point, that is used throughout the passage indicates that this land beast will use force to compel those who dwell on the earth to render honor to the first beast. That is to say, this beast will not persuade people to worship the beast, but rather will compel them to do so. Now, the word that is used for cause is the Greek word poieo. And technically, this word means to make. Uh, in many contexts, it's a neutral word. It simply means to make. It doesn't mean to compel. So why do we believe that in Revelation 13, it means to compel? Because in Revelation 3, verse 9, it is used in that sense in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 3, verse 9, where God says, that he will make the synagogue of Satan come and worship before the feet of, of God's people. So is that, does that mean that God is going to force the, the synagogue of Satan to come and do that? Absolutely. And so in Revelation, uh, the sense of this word means to compel. And many modern versions have caught that nuance, and they don't simply say they make, the beast makes people do it. Uh, rather, the expression is used, will compel them to do so because force is going to be used. Then the next paragraph, the sign of the land beast bringing fire down from heaven is reminiscent of Elijah when he brought fire down on Mount Carmel. Uh, I wish we had time to amplify that specific point, the fire that fell on, on Mount Carmel. You know, that really represents the final loud, loud cry of God's people on earth. And the fire represents the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the fire falls, and Elijah says, if the Lord is God, follow him, and if Baal, follow him, and the fire is united with Elijah's message, the people say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So in the final loud cry, are there going to be many people who are going to say, the Lord, he is God, by the fire that falls down from heaven? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we would have to look at the whole Elijah typology in order to get the complete picture of this. But also we had tongues of fire when? On the day of Pentecost. So is the fire related to the power of the Holy Spirit? United with a message? Absolutely. Now another backdrop behind the story of the beast, his image and his mark, and the number 666 is found in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, it's as subtle as a freight train that uh, Revelation 13, 11 to 18 is related to Daniel 3. You say, why? Because you have a beast. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar lived for a while like a beast, didn't he? Uh, and he raises up an image, and he commands everyone to worship the image, and whoever doesn't worship the image will be killed. And the image is made of what? Of gold. It's in honor of the god, sun god Marduk that uh, this image that Nebuchadnezzar has made, and he's commanding everyone to worship on pain of death. Is that the picture we have in Revelation 13, 11 to 18? Of course. 
the beast, raises an image, he commands everyone to worship, whoever doesn't worship will be what? Will be killed. So you know that in the background of Revelation 13 you have to understand the story of Daniel chapter 3. And I would also add Daniel chapter 6. Now uh, the image is the word eikon in Greek where we get the word icon from. And it refers to a likeness or a reflection of something or someone. For example, it's used in Matthew 22 verse 20 to describe the image of Caesar on a Roman denarius. So are you understanding that this is going to be a, uh, this is going to be a reflection of what the first beast was? And what is the main characteristic of the first beast? You tell me, what is the main characteristic of the first beast? What is the main characteristic of the papacy? What does the word papacy mean? It means the union of church and state. That is the fundamental point that we're going to see in every one of these prophecies. When the, when the civil power of Rome is removed in 2 Thessalonians 2, the church assumes civil power. We noticed in Daniel 2, the mixture of the iron and the clay. In, Rev in Daniel chapter 7, we have once again a little horn who is using the civil power to persecute. In every one of the passages, we find that the central characteristic of the papacy is the union of church and state. That's what makes the, the, the United States of America so radically different in its principles. Just totally and radically opposite of what the papacy is. But we know that, you know, let, let me ask you this. In, in, what, in what way is a lamb similar to a dragon? In no way. And yet here we have a nation that has two horns like a lamb and it speaks like a dragon. It's a contradictory you know, could I say that it's a, it's a schizophrenic beast? <laughs> it has a dual personality because it claims one thing, but it does what the papacy did. It joins church and state to persecute. Are we doing well so far? Now, let's continue and speak a little more specifically about the beast from the earth. In Revelation 13, 11, we find a description of a two-horned beast that rises from the earth. It will compel the entire world to worship the beast that was wounded with the sword. So let's read Revelation 13 verse 11 where we have a description of this beast. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now as I mentioned before, the next paragraph emphasizes that it appears like the destiny of this second beast is simply to help the first beast recover the power that it lost when it received the deadly wound and when it was thrown into captivity. We already covered that point. What's remarkable about this beast, towards the end of this uh, portion of the syllabus, what's remarkable about this beast is its split personality. While it has two horns like a lamb, it simultaneously speaks like a dragon. This is an important point. Notably, the two horns are not broken off. And then it speaks like a dragon. No, it speaks like a dragon while it still has the two horns. <laughs> this is significant. In other words, it is going to contradict the principles upon which it is founded. It speaks like a dragon while it still continues to have the two lamb-like horns on its head. The character of this beast is reminiscent of the split personality manifested by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, I have a book that I wrote uh, that uh, has that title in it. Now, we've already mentioned the introductory statements in, in the book of Revelation, so we don't have to deal a lot with that. Do you remember that, that many times when a series begins, a verse is given, summarizing the total career or the total period that is going to take place, beginning and ending point and everything in between? Well, we have the same thing in Revelation 13 verse 11. You know, it says that this beast has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. Does it speak like a dragon when it first rises to power? No. It has two horns like a lamb. There's going to be a period of peace, but it's going to end up what? Speaking like a dragon. So Revelation 13, 11 summarizes the whole career in one verse. 
It gives you the beginning point, it has two horns like a lamb, and it gives you the ending point, it speaks like a dragon. This is very, very common in the book of Revelation. Now uh, we are going to skip the next section because we already dealt with that, three stages of the dragon in Revelation 12 and 13, and we are going to go to the following page, summary of Revelation 12, and even though we dealt with this again, I'm going to uh, mention it quickly because it is crucially important to what we're studying. Revelation chapter 12 has three stages. First of all, the first stage is when the dragon tried to slay the child. The second stage is when the dragon persecuted the woman for 1260 years. The third stage is when the dragon once again persecutes the remnant of the woman's seed. And, uh, and this is the reason why Revelation 13 verse 4 tells us that the people will worship the dragon and they will worship the beast. See, they're not only going to worship the beast, they're also going to worship who? The dragon, because the dragon is behind the beast. Are you with me or not? Now, notice Ellen White in Great Controversy 581, we already read this statement, but in this context let's read it again. Is the United States going to have a Roman element? Yeah, it's speaking like a dragon. Notice Ellen White caught that nuance. She wrote, the papacy is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur, incur reproach and persecution. So are we to expect a Roman element at the end of time? Absolutely. Ellen White knew that this, that this beast from the earth was going to have a Roman element, was going to do everything with reference to Rome. Now we need to identify this beast. You know, we've assumed that this beast is the United States. But now let's take a look at several characteristics of this beast to see if we can identify this beast. Characteristic number one, it is universally agreed among students of apocalyptic prophecy that beasts represent what? Kingdoms or nations. In the book of Daniel, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon beast, the ram, the he-goat, all represent what? nations. So would we expect a beast here to represent a nation? Of course we would. The noted Bible commentator Adam Clark wisely remarked about this beast the following, as a beast has already been shown to be the symbol of a kingdom or empire, the rising up of this second beast must consequently represent the rising of another empire. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So this must be a nation, or it must be an empire. Characteristic number two, the historical flow of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, 1 through 10, reveals the time when this beast would arise. You say, what do you mean? All we have to look at, at is the chain of prophecy, folks to know when this beast is going to rise. Because you have, first of all, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire divided, the papacy rules 1260 years, and then you have the beast that rises from the earth. So when are we to expect this beast from the earth? Back in the times of Babylon? Back in the period of the Roman Empire? during the 1260 years? No! It is when the first beast receives its deadly wound that we are to expect this beast to rise. Around 1798, 
the chronology is clear. See, when you see the prophetic chain, this is the beauty of the Adventist method of interpreting Bible prophecy. It's a disciplined approach. It's not guesswork. It's not conjectures. It is scientific. It is mathematical, if you please. See, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn, beast from the earth. It has to arise around the year 1798. What is yet to occur? What is yet to occur is the healing of the deadly wound. Incidentally, do you know when the founding documents of the United States were ratified? The Declaration of Independence in 1776, the Constitution in 1787, and the Bill of Rights in 1791, and the deadly wound is in 1798. You say, well, but the United States didn't rise in 1798. They, they were doing these documents before. Well, we need to understand that when the Bible says that Medo-Persia rose, it doesn't mean, you know, we say the year 539 is Medo-Persia. Well, Medo-Persia was already rising to power before that. Just 539 is, is the, the crucial moment. Are you following me or not? And so, and so this beast rises in the realm of 1798. In other words, this beast was already rising to power when the first beast was about to receive its deadly wound. This is amazing. Now, notice the third characteristic, and this is related to what we just read, and we're going to read it now from uh, the book of Revelation itself. Uh, it says in Revelation 13, verses 10 and 11, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That's a deadly wound, right? What year are we talking about there? 1798. And now notice, here's the patience and the faith of the saints then. So when the first beast goes into captivity and receives the wound with a sword, it says then. So do we have a historical reference as to when this second beast is going to rise? Yes, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Are you catching the characteristics? No, we're not guessing here. You know, or say, well, the land beast, let's see, that might be ISIS. <laughs> it's all guesswork. You know, every time a nasty individual appears on the scene, uh, evangelicals begin saying, well, maybe. I even have a book where they said that Saddam Hussein was, going, was the Antichrist because he was rebuilding Babylon, literal Babylon. Well, so much for that theory. <laughs> Unless he's going to resurrect from the dead. And he will in the second resurrection. Yes. <laughs> Notice characteristic number four. The earth must represent a sparsely populated area because all of the other beasts arose from the sea of multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In Revelation 13, 11, there is no reference to waters, there is no reference to winds, or to savage beasts. The land beast did not have to war with any previous empire. Is that significant? Yes, very significant. In fact, Daniel J. Burstyn, uh, who was uh, many years the librarian of the Congress of the United States, in his 1975 Wreath Lectures uh, said this, The vacancy of North America was to prove to be its peculiar promise to the world. Emptiness was America's special fertility. What does emptiness mean? That there was a scarcity of population, is what he's saying. Characteristic number five. We're told that this power was just rising around 1798. It had, it had not reached the apex of its power. Uh, it says that it was coming up out of the earth. Matthew 13, verse 7 tells us what coming up means. Uh, it, it says there, speaking in the parable of the sower, and some fell among the th thorns, and the thorns, what? Sprang up and choked them. So this nation was just springing up around the year 1798. Uh, notice what uh, G.A. Townsend had to say in the New World compared with the Old. The history of the United States was separated by a beneficent providence from the wild and cruel history of the rest of the continent. And like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. Like a silent seed. See, the little seed is planted. Like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. 
Let me ask you, did this, did this power, after it just was sprouting in 1798, did it become a global power? Yeah. You better believe it did. Let me ask you, the little horn, did the, was the little horn little at first? Did it become greater than its fellows? Yes, ah, you can read it in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. See, the little horn, actually in the Hebrew it says, a horn that grew from littleness. But did it stay little? No. no. This beast was just rising in 1798, but boy, it was going to grow into a world superpower. Characteristic number six, the four beasts of Daniel 7 arose from the sea. The first two beasts were Asiatic powers, Babylon and Medo-Persia. The next two beasts were European powers, Greece and Rome. The land beast with lamb-like horns could not then rise in Europe or in Asia. Because if they'd risen, if, if the beast had risen in Asia or Europe, we would have been told that it rose from where? From the sea, of course. The, the beast with lamb-like horns rose from the earth, and thus it must have risen in a different place than the first four beasts. The fulfillment of prophecy seems to move from east to west. So this nation must arise further west than the nations of Daniel 7. Let me ask you, what is west of Europe? Do not tell me it's the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> it is America that is west of Europe. Characteristic number seven, the territory in which this nation later arose provided what? Refuge for the woman who was persecuted by the sea beast during the 1260 years. So did the earth exist before the beast came up from the earth? Sure. Did the earth provide refuge for the woman who was persecuted in Europe before this was formed into a nation? Yes, we noticed that yesterday. Characteristic number eight. Whereas the beasts of Daniel 7 ruled in succession, the land beast is contemporaneous or coexistent with the sea beast, but the sea beast is much older. You know, with the first beast, uh, you know, each beast falls, right? Yeah. Ceases to rule. But here we have a cooperative relationship. Mm -hmm. The first beast, its wound is healed by the help of the first beast, and then they work together. Is that an important characteristic? Mm -hmm. Very important. But the second beast is a lot younger than the first beast, right? Because it's after the first beast has ruled 1260 years and received a deadly wound that this young beast rises. And the problem is the young beast does not have the wisdom of the first beast. And so it gets hoodwinked. It gets fooled because it thinks it knows so much. You know, the United States, we think we know everything but we know absolutely nothing when it comes to this because Ellen White says the papacy has over a thousand years of experience. The papacy, she says, can read what will be because of the experience that it has had. Not that the papacy can read the future, but it can read the future because it knows it has the trajectory in the past. And the United States does not have that. Characteristic number nine, later in its history, this nation would grow into a worldwide superpower. Economically, because it would forbid to buy and sell. Militarily, because it would enforce the mark of the beast on pain of death. And politically, because it would lead all nations of the world to worship the first beast. Now look at the population of the United States to see if this nation has grown from littleness. 1701, the United States had 260,000 population. Oh, for those days. <laughs> in 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was, uh, was ratified, uh, we had 2.8 million. In 1800, the United States had grown to 5,236,000. In 1900, 100 years later, the United States had 76,212,000. In 1950, just 50 years later, the United States had grown to 
And between 1950 and 2016, which is 66 years, it has grown from 151 million to over 340 million population. I would say that's growth. <laughs> Finally, the last characteristic is what is going to engage us for the rest of this period and probably the rest of the morning. This beast has two horns like a lamb, but it ends up speaking like a dragon. So we need to take a closer look at the two horns because I believe that this is the most important characteristic to identify this power. Now, have we given enough evidence that this would be the United States? I think we've given plenty of evidence. But this is the most important characteristic, and we're going to take quite a while to deal with the two horns like a lamb. Now, Seventh-day Adventist interpreters have been accused of being inconsistent because they teach that the two lamb-like horns in Revelation 13, 11, represent two principles upon which the United States was built, civil and religious liberty. While they teach that horns in other places represent what? Kingdoms. And so even um, uh, theologians within the Adventist Church say Adventists, you know, they're, they're all messed up when they study Bible prophecy because some places they say that the horns represent principles and in other places they say they represent kingdoms. They're inconsistent. But we shall find in our study that there is really no inconsistency at all. As we proceed, so this is one of the inconsistencies in people's brains <laughs> because they don't study things carefully. As we proceed in our study, we will see that the principles of civil and religious liberty are based upon the idea of two distinguishable and separable kingdoms in one nation. So the idea of civil and religious liberty behind that, the foundation is the idea of church and state functioning separately. The state would be civil liberty and the church would be religious liberty. So, so there's no contradiction really. Adam Clark had it straight, this uh, old Bible commentator. He said, uh, not old in age, but uh, he, he wrote uh, 150 years ago at least, it says, as the seven-headed beast is represented as having ten horns, which signifies so many kingdoms leagued together to support the Latin church, so the beast which rises out of the earth has also two horns, which must consequently represent two kingdoms. Is he consistent? Of course. For if horns of a beast mean kingdoms in one part of the apocalypse, kingdoms must be intended by this symbol whenever it is used in a similar way in other parts of this book. Nice way of putting it. So the two horns must represent two kingdoms. Now say, do we have any biblical foundation for what Adam Clark has to say? Of course we do. The closest parallel to Revelation 13 verse 11 is found in Daniel chapter 8. So let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and we'll read verse... Um, First of all, verse 3, and then we will go to verse 20. It says there, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, only one beast, right? A ram, one beast, which had what? Two horns. So do we have a beast with two horns in Revelation 13? Yes. Do we have one in Daniel 8? would we think that the meaning of the horns would be similar in both contexts? Of course. Now, and it says the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. And then comes the explanation at the end of the chapter. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. So the two horns represent two kingdoms within one nation. A nation that has two kingdoms. Are you with me or not? It will be noticed that the ram represents one nation that was composed of two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians. The inevitable conclusion is that the two horns like a lamb in Revelation 13 verse 11 symbolize two kingdoms that exist side by side within a single nation. 
And of course, I know you're thinking, does the United States, is the U.S. composed of two kingdoms and one nation? Absolutely. Now, why are the horns lamb-like? Revelation uses the word lamb 29 times, as I mentioned before. And in 28 of those references, it refers indisputably to Christ. Does it apply to Christ as well in Revelation 13, verse 11? Once again, Ranko Stefanovic in his commentary, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, page 419, uh, states this. The symbol of the Lamb in Revelation always refers to Christ, which suggests that the reference here is not to any lamb, but clearly to the lamb. Thus, the appearance of the earth beast is described in Christ-like terms, suggesting a very possible history of this power with a religious overtone. Now, the, the uh, two horns like a lamb are antithetical to the speaking like a dragon. The lamb, the beast that has lamb-like horns has these horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. So the lamb-like horns must be the positive side of this beast, right? Because you have a contrast. Whereas the speaking like a dragon must be the negative side of this beast. So this beast has a positive side and it has a negative side. And it's going to contradict the positive side when it speaks like a dragon. Now, the question is, why are these two horns like a lamb? The lamb represents Christ. So this must mean that these are the two kingdoms that were recognized by whom? They are the two kingdoms that were recognized by Christ the Lamb. And so the big question is, which kingdoms did Jesus Christ recognize as being legitimate? Well, we already read Matthew 22, verses 15 through 21. I'm only going to read the last verse, verse 21. Uh, and he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. Which two kingdoms did Jesus, the Lamb of God, recognize? He recognized the kingdom of the state and the kingdom of the church. Now here's the question. Was the United States founded upon the idea that there could be in this nation two kingdoms separate from one another, functioning each in its own sphere with its own sword where one did not interfere with the other. Absolutely. Now, let's notice uh, at the bottom of the page. Now the question must be asked. What nation or kingdom was beginning to rise in power in 1798 when the first beast received its deadly wound? which in its founding documents recognized the legitimate, simultaneous existence of two kingdoms within a single nation, such as Jesus the Lamb believed in. The answer is unmistakable. In Great Controversy, page 440, Ellen White explained about this second beast, what nation of the New World was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation, and only one, meets the specification of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. Did you notice how, how definite she is? <laughs> she, she says, no question, one nation and only one meets the specification. Unmistakably, it points to the United States of America. She had no doubts whatsoever about what this second beast represented. Now, for, for, for convenience sake, the history of this land can be divided into two great periods. The first period would be the colonial period. And arbitrarily, I've chosen uh, 1620 to 1776. 1776, because that's when the nation was officially established. 
And the other period is what I call the constitutional period, which is from 1776 all the way through the days that we are living in now. Now the constitutional fathers of the United States, and we're going to prove this by reading several statements from them in a, in a little while. Uh, these men such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, among others, they knew, and we see this in their writings, three realities. First of all, they knew very well the history of the church in the Middle Ages. They constantly mentioned the Inquisition in their writings. They knew the history of what happened when the papacy joined church and state during the 1260 years, because they write about it. And they say in their writings, that's not going to happen in this nation that we are establishing. We're going to establish a different system. Because we know what happened in Europe when church and state were joined together. So the founding fathers knew what had happened in Europe. We also know that they knew what happened during the colonial period. You know, the, during the colonial period, you know, uh, the Protestants today make it sound hunky-dory, real, real nice time to live in. Yeah, that is if, if you were a member of the established church. <laughs> but if you were not a member of the established church, it wasn't such a paradise to live in. They knew that in the colonial period, and in a moment we're going to take a look at this, they knew that during the colonial period, if you didn't belong to the, to the established church, you lost a lot of your civil rights. And so they said, even in the colonial period, before the nation was established, these people came seeking freedom of religion, and then they took away freedom of religion from everybody that didn't agree with theirs. <laughs> so they knew about the colonial period that it was a, a, a small-scale reflection of what happened during the 1260 years. They also knew their Bibles. They write about, about uh, you know, the crucifixion of Christ by the union of the Jew, apostate Jewish church with the Roman state. They knew about what the Bible teaches concerning the union of church and state and what ensues as a result. The founders knew about the Inquisition. In their writings, they refer to the Inquisition repeatedly. In fact, this is the sobering thing. They were living in the closing years of the 1260 years. Do you know that the founding documents of the United States were, were all ratified right before the deadly wound? They were still living during the 1260 years. Uh, when, when the uh, Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, the Constitution in 1787, and the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, in 1791. The Constitutional Fathers knew very well what happened when church and state were united together. They knew all about the mechanism of the Inquisition and were well acquainted with the martyrdom of John Huss, for example. They knew that Huss was held in subhuman squ prison squalor for months without due process that he had been accused by false witnesses, that he had broken no civil laws, that he had been tried for the religious convictions of his conscience, that he was judged by leaders of the church in a similar fashion that the Sanhedrin had judged Jesus, that the religious leaders pronounced the death penalty against him, and that the church had finally appealed to the civil power of Emperor Sigismund to ratify and carry out the church's decree. And they knew that Tuss was burned at the stake for nothing other than the convictions of his own conscience. Are you catching the picture? So let's talk a little bit about John Huss. He's only one example of what happened during the 1260 years that we could, that we could present. We could present many others. Read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. That'll give you another idea of other examples. The man who was chosen to take Huss from Prague to Constance was Pogus, known as Pogus the Papist. When Pogus went to pra Prague to take Huss to Constance, he was a strong Roman Catholic. But when he observed Huss's piety and how he was mistreated by the papacy, he became a sympathizer with Huss. Now upon arrival in Constance, Huss was thrown into prison where he spent several months without due process. In other words, he's thrown in prison and left there without any trial, kind of like the prisoners in Guantanamo. Uh, finally, he was brought forth from prison 
for his ecclesiastical trial. First, he's given an ecclesiastical trial. The civil power is not involved at first. It's just the church. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, this is how Pogius described Huss's condition when he was brought forth from his cell. Listen to the condition he was in after months in prison without due process. After a short while, Huss was led out of his dungeon into a decent chamber, but his feet almost refused to carry him. He swayed as he walked. Listless and unused to the day was the light of his eyes, deathly pale his cheeks, and loose what was left of his teeth, since eleven had fallen out due to the damp prison. The nails on his fingers were terribly long, because he had been unable to bite them off for many weeks. Upon his skin was a crust of dirt, which exuded an awful stench, and his otherwise brown hair fell in white ringlets upon his rotting and torn garb. His shoes had rotted upon his feet, and his shirt and loincloth had vanished. The rounded flesh which had covered his bones had shrunken and shriveled, and he had become a picture of woe without equal, unrecognizable to those who had known him before. Horror filled those who looked upon him, and pitying people prepared a bath for him, brought shirts and clothing, and refreshed him with strengthening foods for which he could only thank with tearful eyes. No trial yet, folks. After cleaning up, Huss was taken to stand before the religious magistrates of the church. The state is not involved yet for his religious trial. And this is how uh, Pogus describes it. With the clock striking eight and the bells tolling, the procession, notice these are all religious figures, the procession of bishops, cardinals, fathers, and deputies moved towards the church, where a chair had been placed for Huss about which the seats of the gentlemen were arranged. Forty-seven charges were leveled against Huss. None of them were a violation of civil law. Every charge had to do with the religious convictions of his own conscience. According to Pogus, when Huss attempted to present his defense, the religious leaders shouted, much like a mob, and tried to muffle the voice of Huss. Finally, Pogus tells us, when the shouts had subsided, Hust was allowed to speak. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.